Well, all right, all right. So I had to figure out exactly how I was going to uh, enter into my scheduled stream. Apparently you have to go through studio instead of just hitting go live. How about that, everybody? See if I can move that fan. And if you're watching right now, just uh, just put hello in the chat. Would love to hear from you. Also, like, tell me uh, where you guys are from, you know, like what country, what state. Love to hear it. Also, if you could leave a like, help spread this stream. More people we have on the stream, the better. Good morning, good morning, and hello! And I'm going to do a story for Instagram right quick. Let's see if we can pull some people over. Hey guys, doing a live stream right now. Swipe up, it'll take you right there. Let's have a discussion. Curry is always good. Two nights in a row, yes. By the way, if you guys are not aware, we have the great Anthony Cummins in the chat. He is the author of several books, 20 if I'm not mistaken, and I will be doing a video for him soon. 
This is one of the books that he has authored. I will be covering it very soon. I'm actually currently in the process of uh, writing the whole thing out and finding pictures. Yes, guys, if you're not aware, Mr. Anthony Cummins is one of the most important people to the historical Japanese community. He is always discovering new and great things, including translating the Banshin Shukai, which is a full ninja scroll for everybody. So, one of the things that I have planned, Mr. Cummins, is I am actually going to go through the book. I'm going to show several examples of the helmets in the video, and I'm going to see how long that takes, and if I can get like a full like 7 to 10 minute video out of it, that'll be its own, and I'll break it up into parts. So, there could be multiple videos. So here's the thing about like the, the live streaming. If you're just doing like plain YouTube live streaming, it seems to be very easy. I'm actually going through Streamlabs OBS and that, that, that's taken a good bit for me to learn. So very different, very difficult. No problem. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is about that. I've checked the settings and there's just, I don't know why there's the their delay. I guess, I, I'm wondering if it's just how YouTube is. No lag, that's great. So, yeah, if everybody can just, like, leave a like real quick, it'll help, like, uh, grow the, the stream. More people like it, more people get to see it, so on and so forth. Yeah, I don't know if it's, like, my internet connection that was just, like, really poor yesterday, or there was an issue with, like, YouTube, or maybe a little bit of both. Ah, it's hard to tell. Uh, yeah, the, the darts, javelins, uh, they were, the Metropolitan Museum actually has them dated anywhere between the very beginning of the Edo period towards the end of the Edo period, but apparently, um, I did check in on it, there was a blog that said that the one with the feathers was from early 17th century. Thank you so much. Okay, so, for anyone who wasn't a part of yesterday, you we are going to be doing a segment today. It is going to be a, I guess you'd say, a hypothetical what could have happened, what my opinions are. I'll, I'll state that these are my opinions, and I will take you through my personal methodology. So, your opinions might be different than mine, but... This never actually happens, so at the end of the day, that's all it is, is opinions. But what is the segment? I want to cover if, in the late 16th century, Spain 
could have had a successful invasion of Ming China. Are we ready for that segment, everybody? We got one person ready. That's actually very true. There's so many pieces that are titled as Edo period that are actually earlier than that, but they were restored and had pieces added on. It's kind of crazy. Yes, all right, let's get into it. First off, here's what we're gonna have to do. Here's what we're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to put on our war hats. We'll see how long I can keep this on. Okay, so what am I specifically talking about? I am talking about, there is a plan and there is apparently multiple different documents a three minute lag Ugh. I was really hoping that there would be less than that but the there was a 16th century plan to actually invade and it was supposed to be carried out from Mexico's shores in well sorry the conquest of the Philippines was carried out from Mexico's shores in the 1560s Ever since taking the Philippines, Spain had actually had ideas of expanding even further. And, well, it's a bold plan. See, the view was that because Spain had really, really turned into more of like a world power, that they actually had the opportunity to take over more places. And it was for multiple reasons, right? You have the spread of God and the want of gold. And I would actually consider those to be the two big reasons why they would want to do it. So uh, this article from standpointmag.co.uk, which was uh, published uh, the 21st of February, 2012, actually covers it in depth. And, you know, we can, uh, we can cover it Let's see if we can cover it just a little bit, just to give you an idea. Um, so, okay. So, it says that uh, a change back into a military stance from one of trade was inspired by a strong and determined Jesuit Alonso Sanchez, who set off for what he called the Kingdoms of China in March 1582. When he returned to Manila, he reported that it was impossible to preach the gospel in China without military backing. This is what I was saying about how there was a want of uh, spreading God. So he started to talk about something called the China Project. He in fact thought that 10,000 men would be needed to complete the conquest, though a mere 200 would be adequate for the capture of Canton, which is um, one of the ports. So he found himself in Mania talking to a receptive audience. The Bishop of Mania was at the time Dominga de Salazar, a Dominican of many qualities. And if you've watched my Engine War series, he was also mentioned there. He was thought of a kind of Philippine La Casas. By the way, if I'm mispronouncing some of these names, I'm sorry. Previously, he had been in New Spain, which would have been, in Me which would have been Mexico at the time, and was able to preach in it. He rarely agreed with the governor, but they both accepted that 
8,000 men and 12 galleons would be needed to defeat China. And that's where I'm going to take, okay? I'm going to take that number. Uh, I'm actually going to boost it up. Let's say 10,000. Let's say could 10,000 highly trained, fully equipped Spanish warriors, which would be pikemen, arquebusiers, um, crossbowmen, and then uh, sword and shieldmen. Could they effectively invade and take over China? And would they, and also they would have 12 galleons. Okay, so let's, let's start to say, what would, what would these men actually look like? Okay, so I found this picture earlier. Where is it? There we go. So this is kind of what your typical Spanish army would be equipped with. They have sabers. They have, um, ooh, I'm blanking. It's a, it's a straight blade. Anyway, they're mostly armored from the waist up. If they're heavily armored, they'll have like the, the spalders, some segmented pieces. Some might have gauntlets. Uh, a lot of your pikemen are going to have a cross with a tassets that help cover the thighs. They're going to be equipped with something like this, which is very common. This is called a morion. These are all heavy gauge steel. Good quality steel too. Do we allow European arquebusiers? We absolutely do. We have to make this as historically accurate as to what they would have possible. So, what would the galleons be like? So, it's a 16th century warship, right? So, your galleon is, um, at the time, it was one of the biggest, most powerful ships, period. They, um, this is a 17th century design, although they didn't change that much in designs. It has at least two rows of cannons. They are heavy cannons. E essentially, this ship will be the toughest ship, period, in this conflict if it were to exist. It's like I said, these there there's not much difference, but Anyway, so what would the what would the Ming have? All right, so let, let's go to uh, Great Ming. And let's see if they have anything. This is this is typically if um, if I was to look at if I was to look at any any weapons or armor they might have, this is what I'd do. I'd compare. So let's see. The weight of cannon pounds. So they're saying that the 16th century Portuguese galley would have had 35, 500, I'm sorry, 34 plus 500 pound guns. Let's see. It's saying that the late period Ming Dynasty Fangzhou would have 14 plus. Um, less than 500 pound guns. So, already, and the, oh wait, wait, we have an advanced Ming Dynasty war junk, or yeah, junk. Uh, it would have had 30 plus, less than 500 pound guns, and 14 to 22 of the 500 pound guns. So we actually have the ships would have been actually fairly comparable. Y 
Yes, that is that is true. However, they uh, the the biggest thing that I'm looking at is can um, actually I'll get to it. So the okay, I don't know how long I'm gonna keep this on. <laughs> so what a what? How would this um, how would this galleon be used, right? So Tristan Chat is right. This ship would mostly be used for boarding. However, the cannon complement on this is pretty significant. What we should consider is would the guns of this ship allow the Spanish to be able to land? Would the guns on this ship be able to defeat a Chinese ship? The honest answer that I can think of is I do think it could. I think that against one of the heavy war junks, I do believe that the war junk could damage this ship. I do believe, however, that the Spanish um, galleon could defeat it. And I also do believe that the men on board, who would be very similarly armed, like these guys right here, I do believe that in a boarding action, these men have an advantage. The reason why I believe that is because your Ming Dynasty warriors at the time would not have armor that could have protected them against bullets. So, see if I can pull up an, a great example. Um, yeah, the male armor obviously wouldn't. Uh, the brigandine, which is honestly what they're most are going to have. Your, your sailors are going to have light armor. A lot of your Spaniards are too, but some of the Spaniards are going to have their breastplate. Um, I can't imagine that a lot of them are going to be wearing their spalders, but they're also going to be wearing like um, hard hats, things like that. The, the men who definitely are dedicating themselves to going over. And I also do believe that the Spaniards' um, arquebuses are going to be more powerful. Okay, so we've established that the Spaniards are going to be able to get past whatever naval problems the Ming are presenting. Now, I am not aware of any heavy cannon emplacements that the Ming would have had to be able to drive off the ships from shore. Their fortifications, as we talked about yesterday, a European wall will be about this thick, if we very thick walls, but a Ming wall will be very thick, super thick, ridiculously thick. So the the cannons wouldn't be able to take down walls, but would these walls be present at the coast? That answer is, I do not think so. What, what I read about these Ming walls is that they are more inland as opposed to by the coast. So I do believe the Spaniards are, are going to be able to invade. Like I said at the beginning of this, if you're just tuning in, we've, uh, we've decided that we're going to go with the 10,000 figure, which is what the man who proposed the idea originally thought the numbers that he would need. Okay, so as chat mentioned, they, the Spaniards had failed in Cambodia, but what would they be able to do if they did manage to get in inland? So they have a tactic
and it was a revolutionary tactic. It was called pike and shot. So how would pike and shot basically work? Okay, that, that image is a little too small, everybody. Let's try to give you a good example of what this would look like. Let's go to large. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is basically how it, it would work. You'd have your musketeers on the outside you have your pikemen all throughout the outer side. It's a square. And then your musketeers would also, musketeers, your arquebusiers, they would also be in the middle. Now, most of the musketeers are not going to be heavily armored. This man right here, he, he does not look like he's wearing armor. However, he is wearing thick gloves. His coat is thick. He basically has a lot of padding. Trust me, a sword swipe would not be able to cut through this. However, you could break ribs, think so on and so forth. Your pikeman is different. Your pikeman is going to have a heavy breastplate, like we said before, hard hat like this. Um, there's a couple of different versions that he might have. He might also have uh, tassets. Okay. But so anyway, so the thing about these is that these will move very slowly. They have to. The reason why this formation would have to move slowly is they're trying to not create any gaps. One of the reasons why there is pikemen is because the Spanish took the concept from the Swiss. The Swiss had discovered a hundred years earlier that lightly armored men with long pikes could defeat much heavily armored men, especially cavalry, which at the time cavalry reigned supreme. You think of like heavy knights, lances they charge in and they just create chaos the, the knight was essentially a tank on the battlefield but what a pike could do is you could tightly pack your men you'd have walls of these pikes and you'd have one going in one direction one coming up like this and the whole idea is that if someone came from the front impaled if the if the horse tries to jump over Impaled. And here's the other thing. When the horse comes up and the pike is raised like this, the horse is actually going to lift up, exposing his belly, potentially throwing the rider off and presents an opportunity for the pikeman to stab the horse. That's also, you have bullets that can be fired over. The Spanish would also be using crossbowmen. The crossbowmen would be able to fire up and over as well these pikes predominantly though at range your your arquebusiers are going to be in the front of these lines and only when cavalry or heavy troops come in will they go to the center so that they can be protected by these more armored pikemen so the uh the idea of uh, Ming bulletproof armor is something that has not really been found or uh, tested as, uh, as far as we know. So the, the idea of Ming bulletproof armor, I, I don't think that that ever existed. And part of the reason why I say that is if they did have it, they would have been able to bring it to the war against the Japanese. And as far as we know, they didn't. So I will have to go with the idea that it never existed because we have no physical proof of it existing. 
we have no physical proof of it working. And the one war that they would have had knowledge of, um, of guns being used, especially against, uh, because the, the Koreans would have told them that the Japanese were in fact using uh, matchlocks, they, they didn't bring them. So, and that goes into, let, so do I think, do I think that um, Ming guns, because Ming did have matchlocks, that they actually copied from, I want to say that these were actually uh, Portuguese. So let's, and they did have others. So let's look at their arquebuses and their muskets. Flintlocks, this would be late. Matchlock firearms, there we go. Because now we have to determine which we think would be better. So they had, um, they did have Japanese um, arquebuses. They had Western style copies. They had uh, Turkish style copies. In the later Ming period, they had something called the Lumi Chong. So it's an indigenous Chinese design. Anyway, so what we establish is that they do have guns. And I really think that the discussion about which gun would be greater is a moot point. And the reason why I do think it's a moot point is because of this right here. Um, I actually have a copy of a PSOD style breastplate, while this is not exactly a PSOD, it's of the same time period, and they still have the wedge. These are really thick, really thick, and they are heat treated, they are very hard. We don't really seem to have any solid breastplates that the Ming would have been using at this time period. So I think the discussion of who had the better gun is a moot point because I think even if the Ming had guns that were just as good as the Spaniards, and I'd be willing to definitely grant them that, the Spaniards, on the other hand, have single metal breastplates that are hardened. So, if a Spanish arquebus was to hit the breastplate only at a certain range, would it be good? I think at that point in time, when they're trading fire and the crossbows are going over the pikes, I think the Spaniards have an advantage. Now, the Ming also had cavalry. Really good cavalry. However, once again, pikes are designed. Pikes are designed to take down horses. I do not think that the Ming cavalry is going to be able to charge the Spaniards and come out successful. I don't think so. Mostly because as they get close, the horses are going to raise, the pikes are going to find their way into the horses, take down the rider. I don't know how many people have ridden horses before. Theoretically, a, a brigandine can be bulletproof. So here, here's my knowledge on, on brigantine, brigantine armor, is that if it was to hit the plate at the right area, and that plate was strong enough 
to withstand the blast of that matchlock ball. In theory, it probably could save you. But if at any point in time it finds an edge, because you know the brigandine plates typically like overlap, and it's able to push those plates inwards, that is going to be enough for the bullet to pass through. Any soldier that's getting fired upon isn't going to have to worry about one bullet or two bullets. They're going to have to worry about multiple bullets. So I, I don't think that that's going to work. And we also have to remember this. Even if the armor can stop the bullet, there's also the effect that the pressure has underneath. The, um, so one thing that you discover about like the solid plate bless, uh, breastplates and why a lot of them sit off is you needed that extra space for padding and everything underneath and even like air to help protect you. Because if there isn't enough adequate protection, your armor may save you, but you'll be winded, you may have broken ribs, so on and so forth. Hey, how long is the stream going? You know what? After we get done with the segment, I will do more Q&A. We can do like some random talking. We can chill out. We can listen to more of this Japanese funk jazz. And uh, we will see where it takes us. Yes, and I'm actually about to get to that. So, what then could the Ming bring to bear against the Spaniards that would be of worth? The bows are an interesting option. And the reason why I say the bows are an interesting option is because while I do think that the Spaniards are going to have an advantage over the Ming because of their armor, I think that the one thing that the Spaniards are in danger of is not really Ming arrows, but really Ming rocket arrows. And let me, let me show you exactly what I mean. So the Ming had several different styles of rocket arrows. They, um, there was a tube, and as you, you, uh, you drew it, the tube would help it fly straight and then you would light it up. The uh, gunpowder would help it propel forward. Now, do I think that this uh, propelled arrow is going to be enough to uh, pierce the steel of the Spaniard's armor? I do not. But there is the effect that it will have on the soldier itself, an exploding arrow in your face or on your breastplate. It'll cause a lot more damage underneath. The 5G. Where is it? They have so many different arrowheads. Is it this? And this is one of them. Shi Liu Jian. It's a uh, gunpowder based arrow. This is basically like a grenade arrow. So, I'm going to just put this off because it is actually heavy. Whew. Anyway, so, what would the Ming then do? First of all, the Ming are going to be able to bring much more men to, to arm against the Spaniards. I do believe that the Spaniards would be able to take a lot of the coast and they would move their way forward. The idea of the Spaniards, what their main goal, wasn't to conquer all of China. It was really to get to Beijing, and they wanted to go through Canton. So let's, pull, let's see if we can pull up a 16th century Chinese uh, map, and then we'll go from there.
Best of Qing Empire. Do, 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 do. Trying to remember where uh, Canton is. There's Macau. But I remember re I remember reading something where where that was mentioned. Yes, uh, they did have uh, poison arrow darts and everything. I, I think the uh, the biggest thing that we'd have to think is like, um, okay, so let's, so I don't know where um, Canton is on the map. So right in this like red section right here, this is probably where they would try to go to. Um, they would then try to make their way up to Beijing. And they may try to sail towards Beijing themselves. Anyway, so the, the Spaniard plan was, can we take our armies and can we take Beijing and then put in a puppet government and then slowly subjugate China? How long do we think this would take? I think that this would take at least a couple of weeks for them to be able to make that. And this is assuming, we have to now assume, that the Spaniards would be able to fight and keep up and win all the way there. They have 10,000 men. How many men would the Ming be able to bring, to bear? Well, in the Imjin War, they sent about 50,000 at first. They had 50,000 to spare while still keeping China protected. I believe that we could realistically bring the number up that the Chinese could bring to bear close to a quarter million. This would be active, ready troops. Now, these would not all be spread out. Mostly, they wouldn't be worried about the coast as much as they would be about their northern border because they share that border with who? With Mongolians. Uh, and the Mongolians of the steppes are still causing problems for them with raids. There was also, in one of my episodes, we talked about the, um, we talked about the fact that Ming China had an insurrection, and I'm actually blanking as to which, what that conflict was called. But anyway, it existed. They had also, in the north, had to deal with the Jurchen tribes, who were now um, mostly united under uh, their leader, Nahasi. So they don't really have to deal with that anymore. So at the time of this in invasion, this like hypothetical invasion, it would have been in the 1580s. Um, Nahasi is... If I'm not mistaken, he, he is the leader, so the Ming aren't worried about that. So they wouldn't be able to bring all of this quarter million force down immediately. So how many would they? I think the initial amount of men that they could easily muster would be at least 20,000 immediately. I think that the Spaniards, with uh, their tactics could win that battle. I do. The second battle, I do believe that the Ming would have learned. So, what kind of weapons would they bring to bear this time? I think they would start to bring their different cannons to bear. Now, the Chinese, as far as their tactics concerned, would have been a lot different. 
Canton is the south and Beijing is in the north? Yes, it is. Uh, I just know that that's uh, when they were uh, looking to uh, they were looking to take Canton and move north. That way that they could uh, supply their men if they needed to from the Philippines, so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm actually going to make this actually somewhat quick because this is where I think the Spaniards are actually ultimately going to fail. I believe that they are going to have a lot of initial successes and then this is the problem that they're going to run into. The Ming Dynasty at the time is not just China. They would have had the Koreans to the north, so should the Spaniards actually make it past the Chinese coastal defenses, Korea will try to come to their defense. Now, do I believe that the Spaniard ships are better than the Koreans? I do. I believe the Joseon ships are not anywhere near as powerful as the Spaniard ships. But now we're talking a numbers game. Remember, they only had 12. However, the coastal defenses at the beginning of the Imjin War, they had around, they had at least around 200 ships. So, so 200, I believe they would have kept at least half of them to protect their own coast. That means 100 ships could be brought to bear against the Spaniards. And realistically, I don't even think that they would send 100. I think they would send 50. But that's still an almost 5 to 1 ratio. How much cannon shot will these ships have? Remember, they would have just had to spend it to take out coastal defenses and to help protect their men as they made their way to shore. So they've already spent some shot. They might have been further fighting on the coast with other Chinese ships. It's possible that these Chinese ships could have damaged them, already taken them out. Either way, I don't believe that the Spaniard ships would be able to travel up north. So I think from the initial landing, they'll be successful, and then they're pointless for the rest of the, of the conflict. Maybe to protect their beachhead, but no further aggression without pretty much guaranteeing their loss. Okay, so what other forces am I talking about? Um, Thai forces were, and that's, they, they were having other conflicts and everything, but the Thai were also vassals of the Ming. They could also be brought to bear. The Ming have fire carts, they have other cannons. They have several different siege engines. Eventually, the Ming are going to have enough time to bring these to bear. And from there, I really don't think the Spaniards have a chance. Because while the Spaniards may have cannons with them, and I do believe that they will be better cannons they're not going to have as many. And this is a case of if you have enough weapons to bring to bear, you can pretty much blanket an area with fire arrows, exploding arrows, uh, cannons, mortar shots. At this point in time, the close formations of the Spaniards, I think, will actually be detrimental to them, as it was eventually for them in Europe, because those close formations were amazing at protecting them from cavalry, which is why I think they'll do really well against the Ming at first. But the Ming aren't stupid. They're going to realize, okay, cavalry isn't good in close. And even then, Calvary in Europe wasn't given up on. It was a simple case of they were like, okay, well, we'll lightly armor them, 
we'll get in close, we'll fire handguns, so on and so forth. The Ming, however, would most likely be using exploding arrows. They had poison gas arrows too. The effects, the um, how effective they are, it's to me it's up to debate because there has been no modern tests. But even if the effects are, you know, irritated eyes, problems breathing. If you have problems breathing on a battlefield while you're marching, while you're trying to fight, exhaustion can sink in. An exhausted, well-armored man with a lot of skill can fall to someone who is, say, lightly armored, but with good weapons, potentially good training, and even if they don't have good training, if he's fresh, he has a good chance of taking you. The Ming are going to be able to bring more men to bear. And as I was mentioned in chat, the Spaniards had tried to make colonies and take other other places, such as Cambodia. They had failed, and they failed mostly due to the same reason. Now, would the Spaniards be able to bring more than 10,000 men? Possibly. However, I really think that the amount of manpower needed to be able to do this would have to be closer to 100,000, of which the Spaniards just plain do not have that type of manpower. At least not the type of manpower to waste on China. And the reason why I say a waste is because the Spaniards do have other enemies. Those men are needed other places. Um, they would eventually fall to the Dutch. And they would even need Dutch ships eventually to do most of their trading. So, that's my opinion. Um, I know my methodology seemed a little bit all over the place. This is actually my first attempt doing a segment on live stream. So, yeah, that is my opinion. What do we think? Oh, by the way, I think the, uh, the lag now is only like 30 seconds. Yeah, exactly. Um, the uh, if if the uh, if the poison gas arrows even are just like tear gas arrows, uh, this is going to cause massive problems for the Spanish arquebusiers. And here's the other thing: when you have conflicting tactics and different weapons, maybe it's something that you've never experienced before. The Troops that the Spaniards would bring to bear, almost certainly the Tercios, highly skilled. However, new weapons, in the, in the midst of combat, you start to think, what is that? What am I feeling? My eyes are watery. I'm having a hard time seeing. The arquebusier, he's having a hard time aiming. He's coughing. This is, it, it's making him shaky. He's starting to get a little bit worried. He's starting to get a little bit scared. Okay, he's relying on his training, but he still can't see. Um, it starts to become a game of mental warfare, and that's almost more dangerous because anyone who studied uh, combat also knows that if a side retreats, that's usually when the most casualties occur. Now, here's the thing. I don't believe that the Spaniards will retreat. Spaniards have a big reputation for not retreating in battle. I don't think that matters, though, when the Ming are probably going to set up, you know, 100 plus, 200, maybe even 400. There's, um, in that conflict that I said that the Ming had had in the 
1580s, late 1580s, they brought 400 cannons to bear against the Mongolians. I think the, the Ming would have no problem bringing to bear that many cannons again. And at that point, it doesn't matter if they're light cannons, because a cannonball, whether it's light or heavy, if it lands in the center of a heavily mass formation, is going to cause a lot of damage. And it's actually one of the reasons why you had uh, linemen, right? So you had them uh, line up, and then you had rows. The idea was that if you take aim and you fire, one of these bullets are going to hit. And if, it's a, if, if you're attacking a group, you can take out multiple people in one volley. That's basically what the Ming would do, but with cannons. Yes, exactly. So my opinion is that the different exotic weapons exotic weapons that the Ming would be able to bear would almost certainly tear down the morale of the Spaniards. I don't think, though, that that's going to cause them to run. I really think that that's just going to affect their fighting. It might make it harder to focus on their volleys and their tactics, but these are trained, very highly professional men. I do want Chad to understand that. This would be a hard-fought battle, and really it would come down to the Ming figuring out what tactics do and don't work and then bringing to bear their overwhelming numbers and their overwhelming um, artillery, really. Exactly. Um, Taking Manila was really hard for them. Yes, exactly. The uh, the horse archer cavalry, and that's the other thing. Is like I think um, I think the exact second that the Ming realize that their cavalry can't get in too close that's when they're going to start using their gas arrows, their fire arrows, their explosive arrows. It's going to be to harass. Now, I will say this. I still think there's a good chance that a lot of those cavalrymen are going to end up dead. And that is because the, uh, the pikemen are going to be able to protect. They're, they're going to be able to protect their arquebusiers. They are heavily armored. This is these padded jackets. Um, they're actually pretty heavy. Uh, I've I've gotten the chance to wear one before. I can say that they are they're no joke, and they would be able to protect against arrows. Um, there's actually a big misconception that um, they had less armor. It was really a case that they moved from plate and chainmail to minimalist plate and a lot of padding. Anyway, they're going to get worn down, and I really think it's the mortars and the Chinese cannons, because think about it. So if we look at this formation, it's tightly packed, right? If a shot is able to land, boom, right in the center of this formation, There's going to be shrapnel, there's going to be bodies flung around, and they're going to keep tightening their formation, but they're going to keep their formation. This is how they were trained. This is the way they win. This is, this is literally the only hard tactic that they have, because they also realize that if they retreat, they're going to get run down by the cavalry. So retreating is not an option. But this formation, I think, while massively successful at first, is going to lead to their downfall. And that's not to mention the other hand cannons, which 
basically like um, the the San Chanchion. Uh, the the discussion of whether that would even have an impact it doesn't seem to matter everything that i've i've seen from the ming is that if you dig in if you truly dig in and they have the ability to bring to bear their multitude of cannons and mortars they will Yeah, they they could be used on suicide missions. The problem with that is that if we look in history, a lot of the times those men desert the second chance they get. And if they are thrown in suicide missions, I do believe the tightly packed um, pike formation of the Tercios will pretty much eliminate that. Um, there is, as far as like, uh, that, uh, that formation, the, um, there has been some new research. I'm not an expert on European military history, but I know a bit about it. The, really what it came down to is that the tactic it wasn't so much superior as it was that it kept them out of the the reach of the pikes and it only became truly effective when um, pistols were able to really be more effective right the armor and the tight formations they're able to move. In fact, that's actually one of the things that I was saying about why they would keep their formations and why the Tercios were actually so very successful in Europe is they trained really hard on how to move. Hello, how are you doing? Um, as far as like blast wave is concerned, this is something that we would really have to uh, test. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that we would have to test that is because if you if you read a lot of uh, the the great Ming's uh, blogs, a lot of uh, a lot of Chinese weapons names have like very fanciful names, and the claims are very, very uh, large. Like one of them is, is like the Great General Cannon, and you're thinking it's like, oh man, the Great General Cannon. This thing's going to be like this huge, powerful. And when you look at it, it's a it's a it's basically a medium cannon. It's not that heavy. It's it's a good cannon. I mean, and any cannon is better than no cannon, but the name makes it seem like it's much greater than it is. And a lot of, uh, like uh, the Huacha, the Huacha as a, as a weapon in Korea, a lot of people are like, oh man, it shoots like all these rocket arrows and so on and so forth. And what you realize is that the gunpowder... It doesn't bring it up and then the gunpowder shoots it down. What really happens is the gunpowder sends it up and then the arrows fall down and it's gravity doing the work from there on forward. Now they're able to, to put like heavy arrowheads and so the gravity is bringing it down, but you start to realize that this weapon isn't 
exactly greater than basically a handheld um, bow and arrow. It's really not. The ability to shoot anywhere between 100 to 500 arrows, the, uh, the Ming had a uh, fire cart that could shoot 500 arrows. It's about mass and quantity, but the quality is something that we really have to compare. There's a reason why weapons, the, the Ming were incredibly inventive and incredibly uh, creative. But there's a lot of weapons that they used that weren't really practical. They sound really cool on paper, but when they're put into practice, is a little bit different. So the blast wave is something that we really have to, we, we would really have to test. And that's because what is on paper, what is said about these weapons, isn't always as great as reality. Yeah, it, it was a moral killing weapon. And that's what I'm saying about like the suicide missions, why I don't think that they would be that successful. I, the, the pikes, I, I believe, are going to be able to keep them at a great enough distance that it's not going to do much. I have doubts that the blast wave would actually, um, I think it would make their eyes squint. I believe that the, uh, the powder in the air, the smoke would make them cough and things like that. I don't think, however, that it would have the uh, great effect that to actually um, damage the troops up front. Um, it isn't a, a anti-cavalry gun, the Huacha, is that written that way? Um, so the Huacha was, the Huacha was an, air, was an area gun, and actually very interesting enough, you could actually set up, um, uh, hand cannon tubes to where it fires, uh, a hundred, ha uh, hand cannon shots. And kind of like spray them. It was basically like a shotgun. Now that, if that was brought to bear, now that might be different. But that was something that you really needed to be close up to do. However, if it was shot that way, you're definitely taking out quite a quite a good bit of people. Um, the Huacha is really a, a one-shot weapon, and it was an area effect weapon. It one on its own is not useful. Two on its own is not useful. Three, four, five. But when you start to bring things like 20, 30, which is what how this weapon was typically used, then it becomes somewhat effective. The idea is that if you have a if you have a man and he's wearing armor, if shots are hitting him, you know, it's hurting him. It's not killing him necessarily, but it's bouncing off its armor, his armor, it's digging in his armor. The idea is that with enough shots, you can bring them down. And yes, as it was mentioned before, it definitely is a, um, a morale killing weapon. The only thing, and the only reason why I don't think this weapon would necessarily... So, here's the thing. This weapon has been tested. There's actually video of it. It, when you read about how this weapon was used and what it could do, and then reality, it just doesn't match up. But yes, it, it very much was about denying an enemy an area. It was about keeping heads down. Um, it was about wounding, but one of these shots like hitting you, it would actually have to be pretty lucky to actually hit. And if you could use it on cavalry, you could, but it's not easy to aim with and cavalry can move. Yeah, the big problem about the Huacha is loading time. And the same thing with that uh, the Chinese uh, fire cart too. 
is that they're pretty much, um, it's one of the reasons why they were pretty much used as one and done weapons. Like you fire it once and then you're like, okay, cool, get it out of here, wheel a new one in. Maybe you can start to, to load them up at the back of the line, but you don't load it at the front. That's why they had wheels. Wouldn't it be a great naval combat, though? I mean, could you really easily burn ships? A genome wait and bait? Not sure what you mean by that. So the breech loading capabilities of the Chinese were actually, uh, you're talking about the Fo Lang Ji. Uh, the Fo Lang Ji was actually copied from Portuguese breech loading guns. Fo Lang Ji. Uh, oh, wait, may Frankish? Nothing more than hand cans. Or... Yes, okay. So the Chinese created many variant designs of the Fo Leng Ji based on the basic uh, Portuguese model. That's that. And uh, yeah, there is there is multiple uh, different ones. The uh, the span the Spaniards on their ships would would have been able to have those too. I just think that like twelve Spanish galleons is not really enough to really, like I said, I think at first fighting in one area they'd be able to take that area. They may be able to protect it for a time but they just don't have the numbers to really be able to hold it for long. Yep, they, they, uh, they did have uh, breech loading guns, which is kind of crazy. Um, oh, to, to set a ship a, a light, it isn't. So here, here's the thing that you have to think about. So like a ship, and uh, I was actually, I, I know a good bit about ships. Um, so the ship, as it sits in water, about a third to a half of it is submerged underneath the water. As the waves hit, it rocks back and forth. The decks are going to not be dry. For the most part, a lot of the decks are going to be wet. Um, if you've ever gone sailing, I have before, um, you realize just how much moisture is actually all over the place. Plus, there's buckets of water and things like that. The So, it, it, if you were able to catch it on fire, it, it's, it's very highly unlikely doing that. Like I said, the, the wood's going to be at least surface level wet you'd pretty much uh the only way you'd be able to catch a, a ship on fire is you have to to hope that the sails are dry maybe you could burn burn the sails um hoping to catch a powder charge which would be any area where the gunpowder is hoping to to blow that um if you were able to pelt it eventually maybe fire would be able to uh, dry up an area for it too light, but even then, the sailors on board should be able to put that fire out. It's um, it wasn't as common as people think it was, and catching ships on fire with arrows is a lot harder than people think too. How? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the Spanish ships, you're right, they, they were more or less um, meant to take on ships of their height. However, um, with uh, eventually gravity brings it down, 
one of the things that you would actually do is if you wanted to try to sink a ship, sometimes you'd fire at the water line. Because if you fire at the water line, there's a chance that you can hit the hull underneath the waves, and this is going to cause the ship to take on water. Now you can try to close off sec sections, you can try to like um, hole it up, depends on the model of the ship. However, with enough space in between the ships, the, the Spanish ship should be able to fire and then gravity will carry it down towards it. Up close, however, that might be different. But um, at that time, the Spanish ships will have um, breech loading cannons. They also will have uh, cannons on top of the deck, which um, are swivel mounted, and you'll be able to take them and fire down. So are those cannons enough to sink a ship? No, but that's when the boarding action is involved. And that really comes down to who do we think is gonna have better arms, better weapons, who's gonna be better trained? That's a hard one to actually determine. I probably would give it to the Spanish sailors. However, that's, that's a really hard one because these could be the grenades that um, uh, in chat has been mentioned. Could they be thrown over on the deck? Could this cause smoke and confusion? Yes, there's a whole bunch of factors to figure in. But at the end of the day, I just don't believe that 12 ships would be able to hold any sort of area for too long. Because just from their vassal kingdom of Korea, the Ming could request at least 50 ships be brought to bear on them, just from their vassal kingdom. That's not to say the kingdoms in Siam, which would be Thailand, um, so on and so forth. Every <laughs> Total War game lied to me? Yes, they did. Na naval warfare is a very complex subject. Like one thing that, um, okay, uh, there's a show called uh, Black Sails. Has anyone seen that show, Black Sails? Let's see. Um, so it's a good show. Now, I, I can't remember which, um, which scene it was, but there's a, a, a scene with a, what, I want to say this is like an 18th or 17th century Spanish galleon. Anyway, so what happens, this is actually one of the most... It is about pirates. It, it's set in a fan. It's it's a fantasy story, but it's set in a time period that actually existed. Like Nassau was a real place, anyway. Uh, so there's a scene where these two corvettes are being confronted with a Spanish galleon. The it is one of the most realistic scenes ever. Because a lot of people, like, when they imagine, like, ship-to-ship -ship fighting, 
they imagine like two ships going broadside and things like that. And yeah, that is one thing that did happen. But the actual combat between them, it literally came to... It literally came down to the Spanish ship, all it really had to do was whip around, open up a full broadside. And because it was opening up a full broadside, this was like, what, 30, 40 guns, something like that. It hold the ship and it started to sink because it literally pretty much blasted the side away. This is actually a more realistic version of what cannon to ship combat would actually look like because as much as in society we like to think like oh like speed and maneuverability can take down a bigger ship and it can the fact remains that if both of your cannons have the exact same range the bigger ship has the advantage and will most likely win Can I comment on Nurhasi's role in the Imjin War after the segment? Sure. So, uh, Nurhasi's role is actually a, a very simple one. It was, he, Kato Kiyomasa had invaded uh, the, uh, the Jurchen Kingdom and he, he attacked them and he killed quite a few people. The actual numbers are somewhat subject to debate because pretty much you have to rely on Japanese sources because the Jurchens themselves didn't really write about it, at least not as, uh, not as far as I know. And after that, Nurhasi decided to uh, tell the, uh, the Wanli Emperor in Beijing, like, hey, I'm willing to fight for you against them because after all they just attacked us. In a lot of ways while I do like Kato Kiyomasa this was kind of stupid of him. He kind of was wasting manpower just to kind of prove a point. Kato Kiyomasa was the kind of person that he liked to fight and he liked um, he liked the idea of being able to fight exotic enemies and testing him his men against these exotic enemies. He really liked that idea. And he also really wanted to test, um, like I said in, uh, in my episode, he did have at least 3,000 uh, Korean volunteer soldiers. He also wanted to see how they fought under Japanese command because he would have to use translators, so on and so forth, to pass commands. So he wanted to see how they fought if they were actually going to be worthwhile because, remember, the idea is that they would use Korean troops along with uh, some native, some native Japanese troops, but with samurai commanders, and that is how they would invade uh, Ming China. But, so Nurhasi um, told the emperor, like, I'm willing to fight for you and everything. Now, the Jurchens, the Koreans and the Ming have not had a good history together. It was only very recently that hostilities between Ming China and the Jurchen kingdoms had ended. And for the most part, the Jurchens had been uh, multiple different tribes uh, with their own uh, elected leaders. The Ming weren't willing to let them do that because the next thing that would have most likely happened is that Nurhasi was said, cool, like, if I was to, um, to fight for you, what do I get in return? The Ming weren't really wanting that. They were willing to trade. They were willing for hostilities to cease. So on and so forth. They, weren't re they were not going to be comfortable giving the Jurchens really anything. So, as far as I'm aware, he pretty much just beefed up his own um, border security, worked on his military, and that is pretty much the extent of his involvement in the war, as far as I'm as far I'm, as I'm aware. Uh, 
Uh, why would you want to use uh, cannonballs um, to uh, board a ship? Uh, the answer is, is that... So here's the other thing about boarding ships. Um, shipboarding was not the way it's portrayed in movies. This is actually one of the reasons why I like the show Black Sails, because there is an actual situation in the, I want to say it's the first episode. Anyway, so they put some holes into a ship. They catch up to the ship. A lot of merchant ships, like some of them did have heavy cannons. Some of them didn't. Those were the ones that um, the pirates, or we, what we should really call them privateers, would try to go after is lightly armed ones. That's why uh, like Spanish ships were mostly avoided because trying to take one wasn't worth the fight. It really wasn't. Anyway, so they actually do get aboard the ship. And what the people on board the ship do is they lock themselves and it becomes basically like a castle siege. And eventually the pirates do take them. They manage to outsmart them. The reality is, is that um, sometimes what, uh, what would happen is that the second they were boarded, ships surrendered. You work for the company, but it, it's kind of like this. Is there anyone in chat right now that would die for their job? And that's kind of like my point, right? Um, if, if someone was to invade your ship, they look like they have the numbers, they have that... Al but no, I would not. <laughs> uh, yeah, but so that's the point. So if someone invades the ship, a, a lot of times, nine times out of ten, there actually isn't any big fighting. What you just do is you go, okay, Look, you want this tobacco, you, you, you want this whatever, take it. It's not worth dying for. I don't care if, if I lose my job. It is better than dying. So it's life over work. Exactly. That's exactly how it works. Um, that's, that's actually... Um, there's a lot of romanticization when it comes to like pirates themselves, but from what I've been able to tell, it was actually very simple of, let's catch up to the ship, if we can invade the ship. The, it's also a, a, a matter of, it's kind of a mental um, battle as well. You know, pirate flags didn't look the way we imagined them either, but there was signs. So you have a bunch of men, some of them may have tattoos, piercings, um, beards, they're, they're, uh, they're sunburnt, they're very uh, filthy, disheveled looking. These are desperate men. And so the merchants aren't like that. Uh, a lot of privateers are also formal, uh, uh, former Navy men. So a lot of them actually do know how to fight, while as the merchants, some of them may know, but a lot of them won't. And it really comes down to, if I'm a merchant, I'm thinking, I would rather live. This, for me, like, whatever I have on my ship, it's not life or death for me. But for the privateers, 
that's different. It is life or death. Not taking the ship may mean they don't eat. They can't sail anymore because they just don't have the money to repair their ship, get new, uh, get new sails. Um, someone may be sick. And, hey, women and, uh, and alcohol are also a, a big consideration. Yeah, for the most part, uh, pirates, um, or like I said, we should say privateers, did have, because pirates are, are more like the romanticized version of pirates that we think of exists more in the East with uh, the Chinese and the Woku pirates. In the West, it's really privateers, where it's kind of like, I'm on the down low, hired by the British, so I don't attack British ships, but, you know, other ships are kind of like, okay, like the French. The British actually hired, hired quite a bit of privateers. But the, the deal was like, hey, you're on your own. Don't attack our ships. You can attack everybody else. But if you're caught, you're on your own. That's the deal. Our military doesn't pursue you. Maybe you can harbor in one of our, our islands. It, it was it was done that way. Pirates did have a little bit of, uh, like, it, it really depended ship to ship. They were and they weren't a democracy. There was, there was certain things that you could vote on. And at the end of the day, at, at yeah, there were pirates, but most pirates weren't really pirates. But don't you have to dis distinguish between uh, uh, pirate buccaneers and privateers? Mm, yes and no. So, Blackbeard? Yeah, definite pirate. Um, but, every... Every pirate can be a privateer if he has a deal with a local government. And when I say local government, I do mean it doesn't have to be like a flag. It doesn't have to be British. It doesn't have to be Spaniard, French, Dutch, so on. It literally can be just an agreement that you have with a, um, a port where, you, where pretty much every port had their own ships. You'd say like, hey... I won't attack your merchant ships if you let me dock here. What you're basically doing is setting up an agreement where you're taking certain ships off the table in exchange for the rights to dock or so on and so forth. Um, and that is why I say it is better to say privateer because the term pirate kind of um, leads most people to, to believe that most of these men didn't have these type of agreements. And the idea of pirate that we have now is a lawless man who attacks whatever, whenever. And there was certain areas that they wouldn't attack because if you did, well, they're not going to let you dock there. And you might say like, oh, but what about fear? Well, that works up until, because remember, all of these privateers, pirates, whatever you want to call them, are desperate men. And however strong you and your ship may be, you only have as much as you have. British Navy is always going to be bigger. Spanish Navy is always going to be bigger. Um, you can always hire other people. In fact, it, it was one of the things that actually made uh, Blackbeard so dangerous is that he did start to get other ships. He wasn't somebody who just had the one.
Will you get treated as a military prisoner? No, you will not. See, that's the thing. If you're a privateer, you're, you're literally signing an agreement to where you won't get pursued by that government or that government, like that government's navy. However, you are on your own. So there was quite a bit of uh, British privateers that uh, plundered um, uh, French ships. But if the French ever caught them, a lot of times the British just denied that they had any involvement with them in the first place. There, it's a very complicated subject, but this is where the, the idea of war crimes, because there was, um, in battle, there was codes of conduct. Now, these weren't always, like, followed, but for the most part, it was expected that you should at least attempt to follow them. Privateers didn't exactly fight with those codes of conduct. So essentially what they're doing a lot of times is they're committing war crimes. So what a government would do is just like, oh, what's that? You, you caught a bunch of uh, privateers who say that they were hired by the crown? Dude, they don't have any British flags. They're not our, our guys. And then they just get hanged. A, a privateer is disposable. Pirates are strange. Pirates are very strange. And and it is a very complicated subject, too. <laughs> Trying to get around what is true and what isn't true is very hard. Um, there was a book, I think it was written in the 19th century, the early 19th century. I think it was just called Pirate or Pirate. And that is where a lot of the romanticization came, comes from. Yes, they, they do have the same source. I think now, though, that what our perception of the word pirate is, is the reason why we should go to using the word uh, privateer. I can't remember which historian... Um, but there is a historian who basically, um, he did a, a, a lecture and it was his reason why he used very specific language in one of the books he, he wrote. I, man, I wish I remembered which it was. I watched this many, many, many years ago. It was actually on PBS at the time, which I know for anyone not in America, you guys don't know what uh, PBS is, but it's. It's uh, public broadcasting, and there's sometimes they put on uh, lectures late at night from uh, universities. But he said that he felt there needed to be a distinction between pirate and privateer because, in his opinion, privateer is a better and more accurate description of what we typically think of as pirates. And the term pirate has a bunch of uh, romanticization and misinformation, or I should say uh, misconceptions. So when someone says pirate, they typically think of like Pirates of the Caribbean, how those men acted, and not as the idea of like you said, like Sir Francis Drake, who basically was employed, basically, do you like to study uh, naval history? You know so much about this. Um, I like history in general. That's one of the reasons like when someone like calls me like a weeaboo, it makes me laugh because they don't understand that I just like history in general. Like one of the biggest things I love to study is I love World War I. And I love... Um, I love European history. Um, I just, I love history in general. I just know more about Japanese uh, culture and history. That's where my passion lies. Um, so to not 
get into a very long story to make it very brief. My The biggest thing that got me into Japanese history is at the time uh, when I was very young, I was very into martial arts. I didn't care what the martial arts were. Um, uh, Chinese, uh, Okinawan, um, uh, Sambo, uh, really any martial arts I was interested in. I was also a very aggressive kid. Um, when I was uh, practicing some stuff that I had read in a book at the park, I met who would be my first instructor, um, elderly Japanese man, and he asked if I would want to seriously train. And we made an agreement and so on and so forth. Now, he taught traditional Japanese martial arts. Um, it was uh, is uh, grounded in jujitsu, and his deal with me was that he would train me, but I would also have to properly learn the history, that I couldn't just be one of these kids, that I learned how to fight, and then, and well, and then like I just don't know the history behind it. So that's kind of where my passion for history came from, uh, for Japanese history in particular. So here, here's the thing. I said this yesterday. Yesterday, uh, Socrates said, "A wise man knows nothing." If you always keep an open mind, you always say, "There's more about a subject that I can learn." Then you will have a great time with history. I never want to stop learning, and I w I never want to know everything there is to know about anything. The second I know everything there is to know about anything, it'll cease to be interesting. However. That's the wonderful thing, especially about studying Japanese history, is that really you could spend your entire lifetime studying it and never know everything. Free free plunderers and the name of the group consistently. Yeah, exactly. A, a lot of um, a lot of people who actually study like naval history in the subject of uh, privateers and pirates. They, they really do try to stay away from the term pirate. And it is because the word has... Well, the word is actually more of a modern word to begin with. If I am not mistaken, it was that book that really took the term privateer and then shortened it into pirate, and then it was later just called pirate. So... Just the term pirate by itself is more of a modern word to describe a romanticized version of real people in history from that book. Actually, you know what? Why don't we actually look it up? So, pirate book. Let's see. Was it with two A's? Let me see. This is amazing. Can't know anything. That's the cool part. For German engineering, but I can appreciate the benefits and advantages of our nations. The Spanish uh, thought China didn't have steel, metal, armor, no cavalry forces. Um, the Spanish thought that China didn't have steel and metal armor or cavalry forces. Um, is that true? I don't. I don't know. I thought they did because um, they had tried to send missionaries there but they didn't have much success. Um, that was actually kind of one of the way that the Spaniards kind of conquered areas, or at least weakened them to conquer, is the idea that, well, if you convert people to uh, Christianity, especially like the, the particular strain of uh, Christianity, the Catholicism, if you will, that the, uh, the Spaniards themselves were uh, prescribed to, then 
their rule was something that you would want because it, it's actually one of the reasons why um, the Japanese would eventually start to turn on Christians is because there was kind of that attitude, that whole like, okay, well, you know, the emperor is not really a god, right? Because our god is the true god, and our god says that no other gods actually exist. So he's a false god. That kind of stuff. And the, the Chinese weren't really letting that happen. So it was part of the reason why the Spaniards wanted to invade. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much for being a part of the chat. I love having you here. Thank you so much. Seriously, thank you. The, uh, the Chinese were accomplished iron casters. They absolutely were. That's actually, they were able to, to that the three, I think it's like this uh, San Chong Jian, which is the, the three barreled uh, hand cannon. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, the, uh, they were able to produce them really fast. Um, so I'm trying to find that book. Okay, I think I think this is it. The general history of the pirates. Yeah. From their first rise and settlement of the islands. Yeah, okay. And this was originally pu published in 1724. Uh, so this is kind of like what I'm talking about. Most I ideas of like a pirate and everything come from this book right here. Which there's a lot of uh, misinformation and romanticization too. I find it funniest that, and if I remember correctly, gunpowder was invented from Chinese attempts to make immortality medicine and end up with the opposite effect, to say the least. So that is actually true about a lot of things in history. A lot of things in history are discovered by accident. If I remember right, like, say, peanut butter was actually not an intended thing. I could be wrong about that. Um... I think rubber was also something that was unintentionally invented. Uh, but it's actually one of the reasons why even today, like um, the advocacy of, say, uh, the, the space station and things like that is that when you study something, you you never know exactly what other things you might find along the way. Chinese found steel a long time ago. Yes, they did. China was... So... I... Um, I don't remember where this quote in history came from, but a explorer to China, and I actually think it was in the Ming Dynasty, asked the emperor why did he not send his men to invade the rest of the world? And the Chinese emperor said, because anything worth having is already in China. Um... I do believe that at some point in history, China did have the manpower and the technology. Actually, here's an interesting discussion. Who do we think had the greater military? The Romans or the Chinese?
What do we think, guys? Rome or China? Who had the, the, the greater military? I vote for Xerxes. And Trisha, Trisha just brought up the thing that I was going to point out. This is actually a really complicated subject by itself. I've actually seen a couple of YouTubers uh, tackle it, and I am... They have... Um, it's really hard... Anyway, it's really hard to determine which would, because Rome was used to fighting outnumbered. However, were they used to fighting outnumbered against soldiers that were equally as well armed and equipped? Now, the answer to that is yes, in certain instances, but consistently, because China did have more, and they did have crossbows, which the invention of the crossbow cannot be, um, that can't be overlooked. They also had repeating crossbows. And while the repeating crossbow wasn't necessarily super powerful, they also had a tendency to put um, poisons on the end of the arrows. So if one of these were to like say, scratch your arm or whatever, this could make you sick and make it hard to fight. At that is a subject that I often like ponder because Rome had great military tactics, great armor, a lot of men, but can't the same also be said about China? That's true. And um, that is, um, yes, it's, uh, they're both equal and fought in different ways. You know, honestly, that is the way I view pretty much every East versus West debate. It's all about context and understanding that after the first initial, uh, I guess you'd say, conflict, there's always the chance for either side to adapt and learn from what did and what didn't work from that battle, which is actually the reason why I say that the Spaniards at first are going to have a lot of success and then they're not because China is going to be able to adapt, use their numbers and their inventions to be able to overcome. And as far as like context is concerned, it's one of the reasons why I hate the the whole like, e I mean the East versus West really thing because it's like a say. Logistics have to play into it, right? So. In that that hypothetical, could Spain have actually taken China? We have to think it's like okay, once they're there, are they going to be able to resupply them with more troops? I do think that they actually probably could have. But, at that point in time, could a, would there have been a blockade of the Ming and their allies? I think so. And I think that the Ming and their allies are going to bring to bear such huge amount of numbers that really the Spaniards aren't going to be able to do much.
And I also think that the Spaniards were more than happy to keep what they had because the next thing is retaliation. If you attack a nation and you are unsuccessful, you always have to worry about retaliation. True, Rome did lose some battles in the East, but also did well in general. That is very true. It's actually the reason why um, East Rome and West Rome, when they would kind of split, had different military tactics. I sadly have to leave now. I wish you a wonderful evening. I wish you a wonderful evening too. I don't know if it's night where you're at, but if it is, have a good night. And thank you for, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, I would say Imperial Rome. Um, that is uh, most most of the videos I see that talk about uh, Rome versus China say that. There will always be accuracies in a blank versus blank battle. There are a lot of factors that are rarely taken into account. You're not going to factor in the varying courage and skills of each soldier. That is absolutely true. Um, at the end of the day, like uh, it's it's very true. It's kind of like um, in uh, in sport in sport fighting today. Um, remember what people were saying about Conor McGregor versus uh, Floyd Mayweather. A lot of people were saying, okay. This is why this guy would win. This is why this guy would win. And the reality is, is that a lot of context is really, truly needed. So, for example, uh, Conor McGregor is younger. Um, he does have experience with fighting, but Floyd Mayweather is a very experienced boxer. And not only is he a very experienced boxer, but he's a very experienced boxer with a lot of experience fighting within the rules and limitations of boxing, something that someone like Conor McGregor might not be. Um, I've actually um, said that I truly believe that most of the seasoned um, TIE fighters in the same weight class could defeat most of the veteran boxers in a anything goes match. Now, am I right? Am I wrong? Ah, that's hard to say, isn't it? My, my reasoning is because Thai boxers are really tough. They're used to taking hits. They're super athletic. And yes, boxers are too. But boxers aren't used to getting kicked in the shins. Boxers aren't used to uh, front kicks to the solar plexus. A boxer typically has never taken an elbow to the side of the temple. I mean, he's maybe taken a fist, a glove fist, but what about an elbow? An elbow is not going to have that, so on and so forth. But could a Thai boxer beat a Western-style boxer in the confines of a boxing match? Well, then I don't think so. But it's all about context. What is the conditions that two men or two sides are fighting over. And this is one of the reasons why the East versus West debate is really bad. I've actually said one of the reasons why Knight versus Samurai is such a dumb conversation. And I really, I really do think I should make a separate video on this eventually, is that, okay, say a bunch of Knights land in, um, in Southern Kyushu. How long before their armor starts to rust due to the conditions of Japan. If 
Francisco. Uh, you are not too late, sir. Um, I am. This is going to be uploaded um, after the stream, so you can always uh, watch it in its entirety. And I also think that you should be able to rewind and be able to watch it then. So not to worry. I, I watch uh, particular live streamers all the time, and I always, I'm, I'm always late, and I always rewind it. So you're not too late. You're never too late. Did I hear about the war for heavenly horses? Um, I have not. Can you um, can you educate me? Is Rome attacking China or is China attacking Rome? Because a defensive war in China would be hell on the Romans. I agree. I think I really think a defensive war for either side. I. One side's definitely going to have the advantage. Whoever the defender is, I believe they're going to have the advantage. Do I have a Discord? You know what? I do not have a Discord. I don't have a Discord. I will say this. I'm considering a Discord. I'm, I'm definitely considering it now. Because people ignore so much stuff. Yeah, they, they really do. I agree. If the Romans are forced on the defense, I see them struggling at first before adapting and beating China back, to be honest. And that is, that's the hard part to determine, isn't it? Because at that point in time, we have to, we have to guess how long it would take them to adapt and would China try to overwhelm them with numbers and um, siege engines, things like that. It's hard to say. I would agree. The only East versus West debate that is not totally moot goes to uh, the Persian versus Greece. I definitely agree with that. As there's actual historical evidence that we can actually look at as between the two uh, cultures fighting. Agreed. This is the first live stream I have ever watched. Your content is that entertaining. Keep it up, mate. Thank you, Darshan. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Thank you. You. The Mongol fleets were hit by hurricanes, and additionally, their ships were sabotaged by Chinese prisoners. They forced to work on them. Um, I actually heard that it might have been uh, Koreans that sabotaged the boats. Um, there's so much I could say about that, but I'm still doing a, a good bit of research on the Mongol invasions. I'm really hoping that we can grow our Patreon because the, so here's my goals, guys. I only upload once a week right now. What my goal is, is if enough money is coming in and we can do the test and the subscription numbers is coming up and all the numbers keep going up and there's enough funds to be able to do it, eventually because right now i'm the writer i'm the editor i'm the host like everything it's expensive it takes a lot of time what i'm hoping is that i can bring someone onto the team basically hire someone and that'll lighten up the load to where instead of uploading once a week i can upload twice a week that is my goal right now it's on fridays i'm hoping the other day would be on Tuesday, and that would be uh, four episodes of of whatever series we're we currently doing. But currently, we're doing the Imjin War. Next one's going to be the Boshan War, and then after the Boshan War, because that should actually uh, move fairly quickly, then uh, my patrons are the ones that are going to vote for the uh, 
whatever I cover next. And hopefully if I have a, a, at least one other person helping me, I'll be able to push out uh, content a lot faster. There was a Greek region that had very good horse breed and the, um, the emperor had a whole war to get the best horse. I, I mean, I could definitely see that because um, horses are weapons of war. A lot of people think they aren't. They are. And like uh, I, have a, uh, I have a distant cousin who owns a horse ranch. He has multiple breeds. And if you've ever, if you've ever had a horse just bump into you while it's walking, you realize just how powerful of an animal this is. A horse, if it just shoulder checks you, that could pretty much be the end. They're really powerful. So I would not be surprised if someone found a superior horse breed because cavalry, chariots, things like that, they rely on horses. I mean, the, the Mongol pony was such a hardy animal that it really allowed the, uh, the Mongols to be able to cover vast distances that other armies would have struggled to do simply because their horse breeds weren't as robust as the Mongol horses. So I totally believe that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, samurai armor, um, yeah, the, so the comment is, for the knights versus samurai, I don't think that they also acknowledge the additional armor pieces samurai can have. They use a basic design. They are also made for a different climate. That's absolutely true. Uh, Japan, and see, that's the other thing. When, when we talk about knight versus samurai, we always have, like, it's like, okay, but what knight? What era? Like... A Italian uh, knight in his Milanese armor is actually fairly different than your German Gothic knight. They have different weapons, their armor's different. Now, they're comparable, but what if, um, what if the knight is, has an open-faced bar boot? Well, then that, that's a different weakness that he might have. And also, like, it is, are we just putting, like, these two people on this, like, even arena and things like that? I mean, it's unfair. I actually had a argument with someone on someone else's YouTube channel about, um, it was a Norse warrior versus a Heian period samurai debate. And I said that, first of all, I don't know if you guys can tell based off of my facial features, but I am of Norse descent. That is my people. I love them very much. I don't like the idea of a samurai versus Norse debate because I don't like the, the thought of my people losing anything. But I have to admit that a Heian period samurai has certain advantages over the Norse warrior. The number one being his horse. In the comparison, they took away the horse from the samurai. And I just thought to myself, well, that's kind of like cutting his feet off before battle and telling him to have fun. The air person disagreed with me. I told him that, look, a horse for a Heian period samurai is a must. Were there some samurai that fought on foot? Mm, kind of. But the samurai have pretty much always been a horse archery culture. It wasn't until much later that that kind of changed. Taking his horse away puts him at a disadvantage. His armor, his weapons are predominantly made for that horse. This is a factor that wasn't being considered. And the terrain of Japan would be vastly different. So you can't just put them in a arena and have them fight and actually have that be a fair fight because 
if it was to be an arena fight, the two sides might pick different armor, different tactics, so on and so forth. Europe is a continent, not a single nation. It is. It is. Um, that's the other thing. When a lot of people say, like, um, East versus West, it ends up being, like, the whole of Europe versus Japan. And I'm like, guys, if the whole of Europe is what you're using to compare, that's like saying it's just like, like, hey, what if I took 100 Marines versus one guy in the woods who has uh, a fairly decent, like, armory? Well, I, the, the 100 Marines kind of have a big advantage, you don't think? I like Norse country. Me too. I have to. <laughs> well, I don't have to, but I, I, I genuinely do. Nords are cool, pun intended. Yeah, I'll, I'll forgive you for that one. Yeah, so if anyone's actually ridden a horse before, you realize just how high up you are, and your own horse can be, uh, can be uh, a danger to you. If you fall off, off to the side and like one of his hooves hit you, that, that hoof hitting your head, that can be it. it, it can, that could kill you. Horses are so powerful. The, the, some of the smallest breed, weakest horses are still incredibly powerful. Um, so one thing is a lot of people would have commented that Japan didn't have a lot of um, armor on their horses. And they did, but not a lot. Now, why is that? Well, it's because a horse is such a powerful animal. It's such a muscular, robust animal, especially the, uh, the Japanese uh, Kiso and the, the other breed horses, a lot of which are extinct now, by the way. These are smaller horses, but their haunches are thicker. Their muscles are thicker. They're just a really thick, beefy little horse. And the Japanese found that there was a recording after one battle where most of the horses had survived, but most horses had 10 or more arrow wounds. And very few of the horses died from their wounds. In fact, a horse would be shot with a bow and still go and would still fight with almost no reaction to the actual animal. I'm sure the animal was in pain, but that's where Bajitsu comes in. Bajitsu, or the study of riding a horse, isn't just training for the rider. It's training for the horse itself. Um, so... In, in there, there's a uh, one movie. It's a uh, it was an older samurai style movie. I'm trying to think of what the the movie is. Um, I want to say it's Heaven and Earth, but there's a scene where the two horses um, come up and they're actually encircling each other while the actors are fighting with their uh, with their yari. So that's actually very realistic as to what actual. Um, horse samurai fighting was like. The horse is acknowledging what the other horse and the other rider is doing and is also moving to give his rider a better position. It's a, it's a, it's a deep trust between uh, animal and rider and the horse knows it's going to battle and knows it's going to get hurt. So mentally, this animal has that in its head already. It's a, horses are incredible incredible animals. They are definite weapons. Um, try, look, look, I don't, I, if this channel gets big enough, like we have some property a out here, I would love to buy a horse and um, do videos on that. Yeah, so, so they did, uh, one, um, uh, Samurai had uh, foot armor 
uh, um, full hand gauntlets, uh, back leg protections. Full. Yes, they they did. Um, I I don't know if you're referencing to um, what about taking the uh, samurai off his horse was. Um, there wasn't really like samurai off their horses. I'm specifically just talking about the Heian period. Norman knights didn't armor their horses either. I'm glad you said that because a lot of people say, well, knights had armor on their horses and it's like they did, but they didn't armor them as much as people think. They just didn't. So you're absolutely correct. Yeah. So the, the, the comparison of like, oh, well, a European horse had like armor and Japanese horses almost never had armor is a stupid argument because... It's, it's the, I, they're taking the idea that this horse armor was common and that it was commonly used and it wasn't, it just wasn't. Samurai won't fight in the same brute strength way. Francisco, what if I told you that that is not true? They would. Um... So they had war picks, they had war axes, um, they had maces, uh, they had war clubs. Uh, there was quite a few um, halberd-like designs. Um, that's actually uh, one misconception. The uh, and it's it's not very well known either. The there was quite a few heavy weapons and quite a few um, different designs of heavy armor. What we have to understand is who was the person that was going to be fighting, right? So if there was a samurai who was, um, let's just say that this man was like five foot ten, he's like 180 pounds of like raw muscle, and he worked for a lord. Well, that lord, depending on what the time period is, might equip him with heavier armor and say like, hey, you're strong enough you can use like these blunt force weapons to greater effect than a, a smaller person would. So he would give that to them. How is folklore in Norse, Norse culture countries here in India, mythology is the hottest story depository for children. Tales of heroes like Arjun, Krishna, Shiva, Kali, and his historical heroes are big here. Um, so a lot of so a lot of folklore for like Norse culture is very. It's very diluted, but a lot of people don't realize that certain things that they do comes from Norse myth mythology. So there's quite a lot of it out there that is commonly enjoyed by other Europeans, not just uh, Norse people, but they're not really aware of it. Like trolls. Trolls are very, Nor they're very Scandinavian. Um, elves, dwarves are very Scandinavian. Actually, um, dark elves and dwarves, if you go back all the way to the epics, are actually the same being. Crazy enough. I'm not really sure when the two were split. It had to be a more like modern thing. But yeah, dark elves and dwarves were actually the same thing at some point. God of War. <laughs> Talk 
talking about this, correct? The Spaniard fans told me that the quality of their steel was so perfect that the cheap Japanese steel would break into pieces. Um, so anyone saying that Japanese steel or metal is cheap or inferior or whatever, first of all, I have a video out there. It's in the weapons and armor section. I think it might be the first video in the playlist. It's called, it's titled a uh, Japanese metal. Does it suck? Anyway, I will, I will kind of spoil that video by saying, no, it doesn't. Um, not at all. The, um, these are misconceptions. One of the biggest problems is that Katana became very famous because of, I guess the, the 1980s and, and, uh, anime and things like that. So a lot of people wanted to own the sword but not a lot of people wanted to pay the price for a really high quality one. So there was a lot of like wall hangers and a lot of like cheaper ones put out there. And what people started to do is they started to take them and do weapon tests and just say like, oh look, this hundred dollar like wall hanger is the equivalent of a battlefield Japanese sword. Let's uh, like, and it's bent and it broke and look and look at all this. Obviously, all Japanese swords are terrible. I I I don't have anything I heard to say then how do you compare like a cheap wall hanger sword that's made cheaply and really how am I supposed to take you seriously? Fun little idea, horse-sized ants used for cavalry, or, yes, I love that. But at the same time, would you really want to put them for cavalry at the, at the point where you have just like horse-sized ants? Oh, you know what? How about this? Your horse-sized ants, you do what India did, and you put like pavilions on top, and then you fire cannons off of the ants because the ants, they have six legs. They're very stable, right? And they're very strong. So you'd be able to put a uh, pretty, um, like pretty heavy cannons on them. And, and maybe you could just like armor up some of the ants and just send them on their own. I'd be terrified to, to fight a giant ant. How comparable are Waco Pirates to actual samurai? I often see people on the Knight vs. Samurai debate uh, cite the Spanish victory over the Waco as some reason why samurai would easily lose. Um, I have to be honest. When I, pe when I see people actually com like doing that, I really question how knowledgeable they are on, on the subject at all. And... I, so so here's the thing. How comparable are, are they? The answer is not at all. Not at all. Because, see, here's the other thing. A lot of people, when they think of uh, Waco Pirates or Woku Pirates, or because there's different names depending on the culture that we're talking about, right? So the early Waco Pirates were, were based in, in the Japanese islands, and they would up until... Around the 1580s, and there were still some bases, but not really. But here's the thing. They were based in the islands of Japan, not because they were all ethnically Japanese, but because there was a lot less restrictive laws in those areas. So it was just easier for them to hide out there. But when we talk about Waco Pirates, we are talking about ethnically Chinese, 
uh, Jurchen, uh, Korean, and Japanese. And there's even some reports of Dutch men actually being a part of the Waco Pirates. So ethnically, not 100% Japanese. They used some Japanese armor and Japanese weapons because that was where they were close to. But they also used Chinese weapons and, and uh, Korean weapons as well. I'm not so sure about the armor or whatever, but it's been described that they used a mixed array of weapons. Um, Samurai has his weapons, has his armor. It's going to be very... Um, It's going to be higher quality. Because, see, here's the thing. Seawater is hell on metal if it's not treated for it. Um, people who cite that battle, uh, I know what I know the one you're talking about. I want to do a video, uh, like, deep debunking it. I know that there's an article on uh, the Gun Buy blog about it as well. But yeah, it's not comparable at all. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Uh, Okinawans were also part of the uh, Waco Pirates. Like, really, I mean, the the Waco Pirates. It's like pretty much anyone could join. Have I managed to reach some primary sources on the ma matter? Um. I looked at some sources. For the most part, uh, the Gun by Military uh, blog has done the best job in in cataloging like incidents. I think the biggest thing isn't is there a primary source? It's how much contradictions there are. I I, I don't personally have a primary source. Uh, I would I would say that. Uh, the Gun by Military blog has done the best job at um, cataloging all the different sources. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't go off of just one primary source. In fact, I rarely do go off of just one primary source for anything. Going back on, on the horse armor debate, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think of um, horse armor, they should, uh, instead of thinking about, like, the knight's horse armor, which a lot of that was actually for joust, I think they should really look at, like, um, the cataphracts, especially, like, of, uh, of the Sassanid Empire, um, Byzantine... Like uh, like this uh, like this guy right here. This is, and even then, he's not fully armored. You see, his back half is uh, still open. Now you had a uh, armor like this, 
where this type uh, covered a fair a fair bit of the horse but this type of scale armor and everything it's very flexible um i wouldn't call it light because it wouldn't be light just because of the size of it but the actual gauge of the metal would not be very heavy this is mostly to help protect against arrows and like glancing blows but i i think when people talk about horse armor they should really be focusing on stuff like this, which is what the Japanese used. They used um, similar styles to this. They had the Kaiko, which is the, um, the hexagonal plates. They also had uh, square plates that were um, tied together with leather, sometimes um, oval chain links. Actually, let's see if we can actually look at, up that. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's see if we can open this in a new tab. There we go. So this is kind of like um, if the Japanese were to use horse armor, this is typically what they use. Now this uh, this mask down below, it's a uh, ba men. The uh, the ba men can be made of multiple different materials. So the bombman could be made of uh, carved wood, although that's kind of rare. At least in, from what I've seen, it's kind of rare. The, they could be made of lacquered leather. It, uh, there is ones that are made of uh, iron and some of steel. I actually posted uh, one up on my Instagram where it, uh, it's very similar to a European design. But... Notice this, it, it leaves the legs free. It covers the front of the throat. It's flexible. And, and yeah, this is, this is really, when, when we're thinking about horse armor, this is really all that's needed. Would I like to take a look at the letters of the Manila mayor? Um, I would. Hey, Francisco, are you on my um, are you on my Instagram? China had full horse armor too. They basically looked like uh, medieval tank cavalry, just like Europe. Yeah. Uh, China had a lot of things that were very comparable to uh, to Europe. A lot of like their their sword sword styles, like um, man, I wish I had a sword with me. Anyway, they're like one of the opening stances, like this, with uh, one of their larger style uh, blades. It's almost identical to the same stance that uh, Germans would use for uh, their long sword. I'm thinking of the different ant-based war machines possible with the scale er earlier. Yeah, um, I tell you, what, if you uh, if you end up like drawing a uh, an ant covered in like uh, like that type of like scale armor, uh, definitely message me on uh, on Instagram, like tag me in it or send it to my inbox. I would. I'd love to see that. Your IJ name is Japan at War? Yes, it is. Um, if you could like link me those let those letters, because I, I know um, I know the ones you're talking about. I think I only saw one, but I'm definitely um, yeah, I definitely want to make an episode about that as a special episode. So I'd appreciate that a lot. Yeah, and, and to go, so to go back to that that subject of of that particular incident, it 
So the reason why the Waco Pirates are not comparable is is a is a man who has a weapon as good as a man who has been trained to use that weapon. I would say no. Samurai would have been somebody who's trained. Now, the degree to which he's trained is actually a subject for debate, but he would have been trained. Could the Waco pirate have been? Yeah. Sometimes um, sometimes Ronin became samurai. Um, not samurai. Sometimes Ronin became a uh, pirate because there was nothing left for them. The same thing happened for some of the Chinese. Sorry about that. The uh, if you were a soldier and you were trying to escape the light, maybe uh, there there a whole host of the background of each of these men can be put into question. But a lot of these men would not have been former soldiers. Um, a lot of them would have just been desperate men looking for a different way of life or whatever. And. The uh, so during that fight, we are comparing uh, well armored men with standard equipment who know how to use them versus men who don't have standard equipment. Like, and standardized equipment is so important. Um, the ability to have like one man armored, well, all your men equally armored with all these at least decent quality weapons. Is important if one doesn't have armor and the other one does have armor well that man's going to be easy to kill and the heavily armored ones you focus on later if that makes sense so the Spaniards that fought part of the battles they actually used their long pi pikes on the ship and they uh, they put themselves I actually think in one of the hallways but these men had armor on, good quality armor, and they're fighting against men who have swords and basically no armor. How could they not get tore up? So it's a it's a bad comparison. Yeah, if you if you can uh, translate it and send me the the link, I would I would definitely uh, appreciate that. Um, is the Spanish um, is the Spanish um, much different than the Spanish spoken today? I was reading some text uh, doc documentaries about knights, and in one of them they said that the horses didn't charge into pikes because they were scared. Why didn't they use um, blinds? So the reason why you would not put um, blinds on a horse is... So I don't know as much about how Europeans uh, train their horses, so I'm going to give you my viewpoint from what I know about Bajitsu, which is the Japanese martial art of riding and training your horse. So the horse for the rider makes some of the decisions for the rider. The rider will say, hey, I need you to go in this direction, but it'll be the horse who decides, okay, cool, I'm supposed to go in this direction, but while you're, while you're firing your bow, you can't give me any more commands, so I have to know from my experience what to do. Do I, do I jump over this he hedge? Could that make it harder for my rider to be able to shoot his bow? Do I, uh, do I jump over this ditch? Will it do the same thing? Do I uh, walk slowly in certain areas? Like, yeah, so on and so forth. The point I'm trying to make is that, like, if you look at this horse right here, 
even with this uh even with this bombin which by the way a lot of these face masks would not be equipped on their horses the rest of the armor might during battle but the bombin itself might not and you'll notice that the eyelets are pretty big um, I'd actually, I, it'd be really cool if they actually showed this actually on the horse right here. Let's see, do they have any, uh... Let's see, I, I, I want to find one where he is wearing the bombin. You, you notice mostly that they don't. Okay, so you see like the armor's there, there's armor on this one, this one's kind of wearing the bombin. It actually shifts up on, on his head, his eyes are mostly exposed, the one in the, ba in the back has absolutely nothing covering his face. The, the point is, is that the horse is actually trained to make certain decisions himself. And, in, and impeding his vision would prevent him from being able to do that. Also, as far as blinders on like European horses, horses are very intelligent animals, having spent a good time around them. I will tell you that if one horse dies from a pike, the other horses around him know that he just died from that pike and that there's something up ahead that they shouldn't be this is bad so they at that point a blinder may work for the first couple of horses but the ones in the back are going to like stop and if a horse stops very abruptly the ho the rider himself can be thrown and you're if you're thrown from a horse there's a chance of great injury if you're thrown from a horse wearing armor you might think to yourself like oh well the armor should protect me a little bit right I wouldn't say that at all because now it's gravity. Like, let's say your your kit is 45, 60 pounds. That's actually typically the weight of um, of a good number of like the heavy uh, armor. That extra weight is brought down even further with gravity. You're winded. You're laying on the ground, and now look. Now there's other horses charging. If a horse stomps on you, I don't care if you're wearing a breastplate or not. Will it damage the breastplate? I don't I don't actually know. But what I do know is that that's that's having further impact on you. And what if that horse slips? What if a horse falls on you? There's just so many things that could go wrong with that. It is actually a lot smarter to let your horse have the vision and let him still be able to make those decisions. As I said, horses are very intelligent creatures and riders, they direct the horse, but the horse is making a lot of its own decisions too during combat, which is why a well-trained war horse is so important. There was a post on Instagram you made, and there was a Japanese-made helmet of solid plate, but it's in Italy. It looks like a kendo helmet, but full metal. How did you find this? It's very interesting. So, I'm obsessed, and I will literally spend whole nights just on the internet, just following links all over the place. Some of the stuff is on uh, Pinterest. I also look at old blogs that were written back in 2008. I will read them. It's actually where I discovered uh, Japanese duplex armor. Like I said, I'm obsessed. I'm a little bit eccentric. And as you see like from some of my tests, if I have the money, I'm the kind of crazy person that will be like, wow, that's really cool. I wonder if this actually worked that way. Let's go do that. 
So, so that's how I dis discovered it. And it kind of does look like um, a kendo helmet. I actually thought that's what it was at first. It was just a, a heavy kendo helmet. I was like, I didn't understand why, but there, it's apparently held in a Italian museum. And I tried to translate the page on Google and they said that the armor smith literally took the work, like he heard how helmets in Europe were made back in the old days. And then he just wrote down their description and then made that out of his imagination of what a European helmet back then would have looked like. I'd love to know more about it. Unfortunately, that, that's all the information that I've been able to find about it, sadly. Hey, would you be interested in collaborating with the channel No History in a video? Um, yeah, I would. I, I, I love the idea of collaborating. I love the idea of, um, one thing that I do like about a lot of history channels is that they're, they do seem to, to talk and be featured in quite a few videos with each other. I would love that. I love the idea of building a community of uh, learning and knowledge because it's not just about me trying to teach you guys. It's also about you guys teaching me too. I've, I've learned stuff uh, just from uh, these past two uh, live streams. I'd love it. Horse is about a ton of impact with the hoof that bends uh, any armor. Um, the only reason why I would kind of be a little bit hesitant in saying yes or no is just like, when we start to get into um, like some of the European breastplates, there are like six millimeters of hardened steel and they're, they're done at an angle because there's not a flat surface for, for the horse to like stamp down on. I feel like the horse's hoof is going to find an angle and the horse is going to slip off, which is why I said that the horse could then fall on you. That's where I think would happen more than anything else. And then, yeah, you're right, the metal might start to bend. But I just, I can't imagine a horse falling on anybody and anything that that man wearing saving him. Never fallen off a horse, but death fell off uh, bikes, hurts wherever you're uh, wearing. Yeah, absolutely. I've fallen off a horse before. I've fallen off a horse before. And you know what the nice thing? I was riding a, a, a black Arabian mare um, and she knew that I was uh, falling. So what she did is she, like, as I was like starting to slip off the side, she actually tried to lower her body to lessen the impact. And this is one of the reasons why I know horses are so damn intelligent is that horse knew I was going to fall off her and she did her best to have me not get injured. And it still hurt. I was winded. I was dazed. Um, I, I had to be picked up off the ground. I was a kid, yes, but still... I'm not sure, but were gun cavalry used in Japan? Loving your con your content, by the way. Keep it up. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, yes, gun cavalry was used. I'm looking as to exactly the tactics, how it was used. There's quite a few woodblock prints of them showing um, the actual like arquebuses actually being fired. But another thing is that I don't know if you're on Instagram, but uh, Gun Samurai, um, Matthew Okuhara, he, uh, he is a uh, matchlock reenactor out of Matsumoto Castle. Um, good friend, great guy, but he has uh, shown woodblock prints of Japanese uh, cavalrymen, and what they would do is they would sometimes actually get off their horse and use the saddle 
as a rest for their gun and fire it, which is pretty cool. But there's also some woodblock prints of them um, firing off of um, horseback. The only thing is, is that I'm still trying to figure out how feasible this would be, because while you could definitely do it, it would definitely be effective. Um, in Europe, they use pistols, and the reason why is you would draw your pistol, you'd fire it, and then you'd throw it away. Because you only have one shot, and loading off of a horse is a pain in the ass. So, it's possible though, I saw a reference somewhere, that there would be uh, retainers off to the side of battle who would already have preloaded rifles and what the horse uh, men would do is come by, pick up the gun, go off, fire it, come back, get his, his new gun, and they would just trade back and forth. I don't know how feasible that is. I don't know if that was just for one particular battle or if it was experiments or what, but stay tuned. I am doing more research on it. Learn stuff like the implications of giant ants in warfare. Nobody expects to hear about that in a history live stream. Japan at war live streams will be like no other, I promise. I'll spend the night researching this then. Yeah, definitely. Dragoon style, much more likely, yeah. I'm just imagining the Saving Private Ryan scene where they chuck helmets at each other, but instead of helmets, it's with pistols. Uh, yeah, so that's actually one of the reasons why um, both uh, Europeans, uh, not mistaken, the Persians and Indians also um, had uh, axe pistols. Because once it's fired, it can be loaded again. Like, uh, I'm talking about wheel locks and flintlocks specifically. Like, once it's fired, yeah, you can load it again. But in the heat of battle, you really don't have the time. So firing it, turning it over, and using it is a lot more feasible. Although the practicality of that is also questionable by itself. Afonso, uh, I don't know if you're on um, my Instagram, but that's where um, I'm able to keep up with things a, a lot better than here. So if you have Instagram, Japan at War is my Instagram. Uh, send me a message and yeah, we'll go from there. Absolutely. Yeah, India India does have uh, axe pistols. Um, so I follow a, um, her name is uh, Rachel on Instagram. Um, if you look at, if you go to Japan at War, um, she, uh, dang, I don't, I don't really have, okay. Anyway, she, uh, she works for the, uh, the museum out of Chicago. And she posts a lot of, uh, because she herself is uh, is uh, Indian, if I'm not mistaken. I really hope so, and not Pakistani. I don't want to step on anyone's toes. But she posts a lot about, like, Indian arms and uh, armor. And Indian arms and armor is, that's a really deep uh, topic. It's a huge topic. 
But the one thing that I've discovered is just how much uh, variations they had. Some of that stuff is radically cool. Some of that stuff is like so cool. But yeah, axe pistols existed in India. Actually, another thing they have is the katar, those punch daggers. There's katars that actually have uh, flintlock pistols barrels on them. So you could fire them, I guess, with your thumb, like right there. And then you could like hit it right there. Uh, they may have been percussion caps. And then, yeah, really cool stuff. Seventeenth century uh, Germany used a lot of those hatchet guns. Uh, did they? I I was under the impression that they didn't use them a lot, but uh, that makes sense. See, I learned something new every day, guys. I'm not, but I'll message you there. I really appreciate it. I really do. So guys, I'm going to have to go in a little bit. Um, it has definitely uh, been a lot of fun. Um, I don't, I don't know how often I'll do uh, live streams. Um, I definitely have fun doing them. Uh, I tell you what, though, learning the the software, learning uh, Streamlabs OBS, and I have a Mac computer, so certain buttons aren't available as they are on, I guess, Windows, but um, I don't know how often I'll do the streaming. Um, I'll definitely try to, to do them like every other week or at least once a month, especially like uh, if I have like a, a Sunday or, or maybe Friday, Friday evening that I have free. Uh, the next couple of episodes in Japan at War are going to cover um, the, Eage, the Eve of the Siege of uh, Jinju, because we're doing the second Siege of Jinju, and then the video after that will be about the actual um, Siege of Jinju itself, which is an 11, it's technically an 11-day siege, so that's quite a battle and it's very infamous and um, it's something that if you're a Korean it is still talked about in history classes today and it's actually a big source of uh, tensions between these two nations. Ari wrote you on IG. Thank you so much. I will definitely be checking it out. God, I need Panzer Ants now. <laughs> so when so when someone asked me today, like, hey, how, how was your uh, live stream? I'll be like, well, we discussed war ants. I'm back from work. Hopefully I didn't miss too much. Uh, I'm actually getting ready to, to end the stream. By the way, hand, hand up for the music background. I really enjoy that LP. I, you know, I've, I like to, um, I have a, a wide variety of music that I like and I just thought like you know like hopefully I don't get hopefully like no demonetization or, or like copyright strike but I just decided like in the TV in the background to uh, you know play some uh, more of that uh, Japanese uh, jazz because uh, it's it's nice it's it's calming it's relaxing and I and I want our live streams to be calming and relaxing.
looking forward to more of your stuff. Thank you. No, thank you. Seriously, though. Um, I really do mean this when I say this. Everybody, like, I appreciate you guys so much for being a part of the stream, watching my content, uh, genuinely just being a part of my community. I appreciate it so much, so very much. So thank you guys. War, ad, war ants are very uh, interesting. Keep it up. <laughs> Thank you. War ants are very interesting. After watching your Japanese guns video, I was instantly hooked. I... I... The video's good. The information is good. But man, my camera quality, my audio quality is just so terrible. I've learned so, so, so much. So much actually the next video that's going to be up is actually going to be even I say it's a little bit better quality so one of the things I did is I bit the bullet and I got a teleprompter before the uh, was using an iPad with a teleprompter app and um, it was being held over the camera for me to read off of it while uh, while I was uh, trying to use my peripherals and still look into the camera, this one I'm able to look directly at the camera while talking, and it's it's so much better, it's so much better. And the actual um, the teleprompter also like shields the the camera lens from some of the brighter light that I have, so I I think the lighting quality is pretty good too. Metatron shouted you out once I came from his channel. Yeah, I remember that. And I, uh, I, I really appreciate him doing that for me so much. I actually really hope to, um, to be able to do a, um, I guess you would say like a, um, I'd like to do a video with him. The, the, the word is like not, it's escaping me. But I would love to do a video with the Metatron sometime. He's one of the OGs of, um, of YouTube history channels. No, a toast to you, seriously. Oh, I just realized that you weren't saying that to me, so awkward. <laughs> so before I go, um, because we're talking about ants, I'll try not to mix, miss the uh, the next stream. Um, hey, don't don't feel too bad about it. Like seriously, after after this is done, it'll um, I'm creating a um, a playlist for like live streams. So if you like ever like want to uh, watch one that's already played, like it'll be up there. A toast to Japan at War Two. We hope to join your Discord. Um, I, I will say is I'll probably wait a while, see um, see if we can get like a a a good healthy size live stream community. I've never done Discord, so it would be brand new for me. But yeah, so um, so before we go, like, because we're talking about ants. Um, what other pets does everybody have?
Mom has a cousin. True war right there. I really want... Uh, I used to have a German Shepherd mix Husky. I really want snakes, though. Um, I love snakes. I, uh, I don't have any snakes currently. But crazy enough, I actually used to breed ball pythons. Crazy, right? Piranhas and, and turtles. Whoa, dude, you have piranhas? That's, that's, that's really cool. I only have electrons. Electrons. Hmm. I have imaginary dogs because my, my mom never allowed me to have one. Aw, you should get a dog. Dogs are awesome. I've had a snake for a pet once. I eventually want a gator or a crocodile. Big reptilian person. Man, so am I. I... I went to a reptile expo recently, and I finally got a, a blue tongue skink, which I've been wanting a blue tongue for a while. Um, I will I will say this though: if you do get a gator or a crocodile, try to get one of the dwarf ones. That it's just it's just a lot. I keep a pet tongue, it wags a lot. I also have a pet rock. I mean, hey, a pet rock is, I mean, it's, it's one of the most economically sound pets you can have, right? Echoplasm. I'd love to have a monitor lizard, unlikely as it is. Um, so I actually had a Nile monitor for, for a while, and I just have to say it's just like, I am a, and I'm a pretty experienced um, reptile keeper, and I just have to say, man, Nile monitors are like no joke. Some people, like, they have, like, pretty tame ones that are, like, really nice and everything. And I'm not saying, like, mine was mean or whatever, but I couldn't trust it. I, I just, I couldn't. Unfortunately, he had a uh, disease that he had had from birth, though. So he didn't really ever grow and he died, unfortunately. Yeah, like so, some of the larger like gators and crocodiles and everything like like I I mean just just like a dwarf one's going to get like really big and just the the cost of feeding is just mind blowing. Does anyone keep any insects? Anyone chat have any insects? I'd love a husky just saying. So I actually, um, I used to have, he was part husky, part Malamute, part um, Alaskan wolf. So he was technically a wolf dog. I love that animal to death. That, that was my buddy right there. I miss him so much. <laughs> Dude wants to keep ants. Ants are kind of cool. Like, I, I would totally have an ant farm. I take care of bees here in my neighborhood. That's really freaking cool. Like, do you, um, 
do you try to get honey from them or is it just to make sure that they're uh, that they're healthy and that they're being taken care of? You're not a pet strictly, but it is something enjoyable. So um, I actually have bats on my property. They're, um, they're simple brown uh, Texas bats, but I try to keep the colony as healthy as possible. And every once in a while, like when there's one that um, gets like injured or something, um, I take care of it and release it and I get to enjoy them for like a week or so. I keep a mosquito fleet as a pet. It's an abusive relationship. <laughs> yeah, here in Texas too. I, everybody keeps one. It's not by choice though. Leaf cut, cutter colony. Leaf cutters are really cool. Yes, give us an interesting army ant fact. I used to have a bunch of earwigs when I was little. Really, that's, I've never heard someone do that before. That's really cool. So, um, we here have, um, we have two mantids. We have um, a green, uh, an, an Asian green giant, and we have another one, Let's see if I can pull it up, called a Texas unicorn. And this guy is, like, really funky. So what's really, like, cool and funky about these guys is they actually have like a, an actual like kind of like growth or appendage that actually kind of looks like a, a horn on top of their head. So sometimes it splits, which ours kind of splits like that. They produced real honey, but the honey was not yours. Ah, dang. Army ants are highly aggressive. The primary diet of, of May species being the larvae of other ants to the point that ants evolved to solely defend against them. That's, yeah, that is actually kind of crazy. Despite this, army ants will refuse to attack others. During evolution, hives aggressive enough to fight other army ants killed each other off, leaving only those that were fine with other army hives. That is actually kind of crazy. I know a guy who keeps ferrets. Those were pretty neat. I actually used to have a ferret myself, and ferrets are some of the goofiest, sweetest animals I've ever met. I have a cat. I love my cat. My cat's actually kind of a wild cat, like... She adopted us. We didn't adopt her. But I do gen like generally like ferrets more than cats. Oh, I also have one of these.
I have one of these as well. Not quite as big, but getting there. Army ants are so aggressive to everyone else, though, that they even take down hornet nests despite being about a sixth of their size individually. Ants are, ants are crazy once you, uh, yeah, ants are definitely crazy. Ants are psychos. What's the food of my snail? Um, my snail eats uh, fruit, kale. Um, I buy cuttlefish bone for him, for, for the calcium for his shell. Technically, it's shell. It's hermaphroditic. Um, what else do I typically eat? Carrots. It loves carrots. Um, I haven't given him strawberries or, uh, blackberries yet, but I heard they like them. I should make a sister channel named Ants at War. You, you know what? Hey, if you've ever wanted to create a YouTube channel, do it. There's some people that would definitely, like, subscribe. Like, I'll subscribe. Like, ants are pretty interesting. If you know a bunch of facts about ants, and you can consistently make at least one video a week, and um, you have the time, go for it. I say go for it. end up with an epic collab debating the conquests of the Argentine ant super colony that have also settled in Japan. Have they? Damn, that's crazy. They have a super colony spanning the world. Hey, aren't we, shouldn't we all be glad that there's not like an ant alien species out there? Because they probably get rid of us. I bet ants would have katana if they watched anime in Japan at war. You know what? My goal will be to arm them with a with a yari. That that'd be my goal. We take over everybody. All right. Well, I do have to go, guys. Uh, once again. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the stream. And um, like I said, next week will be a regular episode. Um, for next couple of weeks, there will be uh, just regular episodes. Um, I'm also working on that video for Anthony Cummins. So when that's ready, I'm going to do a community post and I'll link you guys to it. That way you can uh, check him out, support it too. Thank you again, guys. Like, seriously, though, I really appreciate you guys uh, being a part of this community. You guys are awesome.
All right, guys, I will see you next time.